this is scary, there's a lot of you. Um, yeah, so, so I'm Tahi. I work in intensive care. Uh, and this clicker is going to tell you about my talk today. So I'm going to take you through the outer limits of our existence, or otherwise known as taste of general anaesthesia. Now, working as a doctor in hospital, you probably think, oh, it's Halloween, it's got to be scary. It's probably going to talk about things going up your bum. <laughs> I don't work in A&E, but if you're lucky and you do have things caught up your bum, you might be in a kind of one man, one jar kind of situation. Brilliant, you lot of dirty fuckers. Right, yeah. No, sometimes it's not as simple. Yeah, that's right, you can keep laughing. No, sometimes it's not as simple as just a one man, one jar kind of situation. Sometimes you need a bit of general anaesthetic. So. I help put people to sleep sometimes. Now, if we, if we go back to the etymology roots of general anaesthetics, you've got an, which is lack of, aesthesia, which basically meant mental awareness or sensation, however you want to process it. At the time that this photo was taken, I thought it was pretty sensational. I really did. I later realised that actually I just looked like a twat. <laughs> That was when I realised that anaesthetics was what I was practising. I mean, look at it, it just looks like the love child of Kanye West and a fat pigeon. <laughs> Probably one of my better moments. Um, some people think that this is what anaesthetics actually is. I'll, I'll, I'll move my bulbous body out of your way, sorry. Um, some people think that this is what anaesthetics actually is, is that you just, when putting someone to sleep, it's just a case of basically you're going to go to sleep and then you're going to wake up a little bit later, and then you might be in a bit of pain. <laughs> but actually, being chemically put to sleep is slightly more subtle than that, and we're all about subtlety. Now, certain... <laughs> certain anaesthetic agents have actually gained notoriety in the public domain because of unfortunate circumstances. Now, I was a massive fan, so much so that I'm not even going to mention his name, but I'm not going to make the obligatory jokes about propofol and <laughs> actually passing away. I've only put this up here to say that actually the brand of toy, My Little Propofol Pony, was not commissioned by Mohamed or his company, quite obviously because it's brown. <laughs> there are other drugs that we need to sleep that have managed to make their way into the public domain. For those of you that are sniggering in the audience, you probably already know. But this is ketamine. <laughs> most commonly known as a horse tranquilizer to some, but actually makes a very, very good anaesthetic, especially if you want to maintain kind of breathing. It's a sympathomimetic, so it maintains breathing, keeps your cardiovascular output going, and it works on NMDA receptors, blah, 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 blah. They basically help, you know, they, they, they work very well along the spinal column as well as the brain. But the one side effect that they do have is they tend to provide what's called dissociative anaesthesia. Bit tricky to explain, but if I can put it simply, if someone's waking up from it, for example, and you say, Maggie, Maggie dearest, how are you doing? On the inside, she's going, oh, thank you very much, I feel very great, I'm like a big fluffy white ball of light, actually. On the outside, she's going, <laughs> So that's dissociative anaesthesia. <laughs> The good thing is that we can temper this with other anaesthetic drugs. This is Maggie after she'd been given some midazolam, which is a benzodiazepine that tends to work on similar receptors to propofol as well as GABA-A receptors. And they're very good at promoting the GABA neurotransmitter through your system and it's generally an inhibitory one. Um, and that's why it tends to not only keep you a bit more sedate but also work on your memory a little bit. Midazolam is also known as Hypnobel. At one point it had a fashion as kind of like a date rape drug because you don't really tend to remember. Maggie actually is quite sharing and she liked to share it with her cat. And that's why she's here, nice and quiet and calm. 
So in terms of stages of anesthesia, it's actually very common. GABA receptors, the GABA-A receptors are very uh, closely linked also with the use of alcohol, which hopefully you're all having tonight to have a bit of fun. But uh, the potentiation of this GABA in your system can actually make, make you go through these stages of anesthesia. So the first stage is induction. And in induction, you tend to go to sleep a little bit, but you tend to feel quite nice, you just drift off quite happily, and you can still talk during this period. The second phase... Excuse me. The second phase is the excitatory phase. This is when you might notice that there's a certain amount of pupillary dilatation, there's some involuntary muscle contraction, there's some, there's some vomiting that might also happen, and this phase isn't really pleasant. So we tend to try and get through this and pick agent to get through it as quickly as possible. I mean, let's face it, you wouldn't really want to see that for very long. The third phase is what we call surgical anesthesia. And this is, you can see this quite clearly because you tend to get eyes rolling backwards, there's lots of a corneal reflex that's there. Um, and that, that, that's quite good really. This was my anaesthetist on the night. <laughs> The fourth stage is coma. Uh, it's an overdose kind of stage that you need at that point some uh, cardiorespiratory support. So you need to kind of be on a ventilator. You need a little bit of cardiovascular support because you know your brainstem's not working as well as it should. Now, when I work in ICU, we tend to keep people on these drugs for quite a length of time, and, and this can have an undesirable side effect. Actually, one of the most difficult things that we try and maintain is people's dignity. <laughs> and we work very hard at maintaining dignity because of annoying jokes like this. But we work very hard at trying to maintain dignity, actually. And, and it's very difficult when someone's emerging from a long period of sedation, which is that stage three of anesthesia, really. But when they're emerging from a long period of sedation, um, they can behave in, in what's known as quite a delirious fashion. Now, for this point, we need to test often whether they actually have ICU delirium or whether they're just, you know, there may, might be something else that's gone on. So for this bit, in order to show you how we test, I need a volunteer from the audience. So is there someone that's, uh, you don't have to be brave, it's not going to be too damaging or difficult, you're just going to have to use an arm. That sounds dodgy, doesn't it? <laughs> no, um, it's going to be fairly simple. Can I ask for a volunteer? Anyone from the front row? Anyone? 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 Can we give someone a bit of a hand? Cheer them on, someone from the front row. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You won't have to do very much. Who? Sorry. Steve, Steve, you've been, you've been nominated. Get on up here. So, your name is? Steve. And are you single? Uh, no, that's my girlfriend there. I'm sorry. So, if you'd like to just stand here. So this is how we test for delirium. The first thing is that we identify an altered level of consciousness, as is quite obvious because he's managed to get up here. The second thing is, Steve, could you place your left hand on my right breast, please? <laughs> get a good grip. Okay, the second thing that we do is we test for inattention. So... <laughs> I understand that this might be distracting, but work with me. Okay. Every time I say A, when I'm spelling out this sentence, I want you to squeeze my breast. Okay, so we'll just have a tester. A. Like I said, I'm sorry. So that was very good. Very, very good. Um, so I'm just going to spell this sentence. S. A V E M Y H E A R T. That was good, wasn't it? A A. That was really good. <laughs> He's catching on, eh? That's really good, eh? What are you doing? Why you stopped? Hey, what are you doing? Hey, hey, hey. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Steve. That's wonderful. What's an it trooper? 
Now, I'm only mentioning that because I actually was quite embarrassed one day on a shift. Because some of the things that you get in delirium, you get confusion, you get hallucinations. But you also get what sometimes what's known as perseveration. It's when, without a direct stimulus, someone keeps repeating the same thing over and over and over again. And there was this one lady, she'd been congenitally blind, so blind from birth. And she was just there in the bed, and um, she kept repeating same things that she'd heard earlier on in the day, over and over and over again. And her family, actually, had decided to try and make her surroundings a bit more positive, so that she would repeat positive things to herself. You know, so they used to say, oh, you're looking so well, you're looking so good, you look gorgeous today, well done. And this day that I walked in, she was like, gorgeous, 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 gorgeous. Which I thought was really funny, because the nurse who was looking after her really wasn't. <laughs> Sorry if you're here. <laughs> but I decided, well, I'll just go about my normal review and go up to this lady. And so I started my review, and just as I started my review, she went, gorgeous, 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 brown, brown, brown. <laughs> I was like, hallelujah. I'm not actually Jesus, but I might have cured her sight. <laughs> You know, you, you lot have been so warm and so wonderful. Thank you very, very much. And it's been a pleasure to be here. I'm going to bring back Sam, who's doing a wonderful job. So thanks very much, and I hope you have a good night.